wealth healing your body, if you have ever wanted to learn how to go deep into the subconscious part of your mind and transform your life, get ready because this episode of The Higher Self is going to be incredible. We have one of the world's most renowned hypnotherapists, Marissa Pierce here. Marissa, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm well, I'm excited for this one. Good, this me is going to be great. So I've heard a lot of things about you. But one of my friends said that you wrote a book called You Are Free to Be Thin. Is that the right title? You Can Be Thin. You Can Be Thin. And how you speak about um, a couple, she mentioned two things that I wanted to just touch on before we go on into another subject. But she mentioned um, bread mm -hmm. and butter. Yes. Could you tell me about those two? Did she mention bread and butter? She said you made something with bread with water. You stuck oh, it on the wall. Yeah, no butter. Yes, um, I made glue with bread, glue, and stuck it on the wall and showed people that this is what it does to your inside. You know, bread. If you if you when you have a kid, you'll have play doh, which they play with, and it's like plasticine. It's just bread and water. And actually, if you run out of wallpaper paste, you can just use flour and water makes great paste. So it, it, I I turn it into glue to show people what you're eating. So one of the things I do a lot is burn up is take little jelly beans, put them in a little pan and boil them because the very thing that's gluing these chairs together is the same stuff you'll find in gelatin sweets. So you can make glue out of jelly sweets. You can make glue out of flour and water. And when you realize what you're eating, it's like, you know, um, you can clean toilets with Coca-Cola. You can clean jewelry with Coca-Cola. So I do a lot of it. it's very interesting to see what you eat. It's not what you eat. It's what eats you. And a lot of the things we think is food is not food at all. We believe bread is super healthy and milk is very good for you. None of that's actually really true. Some bread is reasonably healthy, but we weren't designed to, we don't have four stomachs like a cow. So when you eat a lot of bread, it's not great for you at all. But it's easy to say don't have that. But for instance, with my little girl, when she was little, I took, a glass of coke and I put her baby tooth in it, I put some jewelry in it and I put a really dirty penny in it. And within an hour they're all spanking clean and then she realized that the phosphoric acid in coke will eat whatever it comes across, including your teeth and your bones. So I didn't tell her, I showed her. It's much more interesting to show, don't tell, because I think, oh no, I'm not drinking that stuff ever again. Wow. And what what got you started on the journey of discovering that? Well, I always wanted to be a child psychologist, but I left that area very quickly because I was very young and I mean, it's a great career, but I think I was just too young to do that. And I went to work for Jane Fonda in LA teaching aerobics in the aerobic boom. And I would say every third person in her class was anorexic, bulimic, body dysmorphic or exercise compulsive. And I realized very quickly that in a driver to be better Emotion will always defeat logic. In fact, it's the rule of the mind. In a battle between emotion and logic, logic doesn't stand a chance. Emotion always wins. It's like you saying, oh, I'm standing on top of the building, but the windows are really thick and I'm safe, but your stomach still drops and goes, get away from the window, you fool. You're going to die up here. And so I realized that all our eating issues are emotional. They're not logical. It's, you wouldn't say to an alcoholic, now come on, you don't need a drink, have a nice cup of tea, because they'd look at you like you were crazy, because you can't use logic for emotion. So I realized working for Jane, which was a sea of eating disorders, that you can't work, you can't do an exercise to get, to get over an a dysfunctional relationship with food. But you can find an emotion to fix that, because of course, you know, if, if we're talking there of overeating, even 500 years ago, the biggest killer still in the world wasn't disease or, or war, it was hunger. So we're wired to be terrified of hunger. To be so hungry, we'll eat jelly beans or taco chips or cold pizza rather than be hungry. So you can't fight that because that emotion is actually to keep you alive. You're hungry, let me make you so scared of that that you just eat anything. Um, you know, hot dog, you don't care because it's a powerful emotion. And another powerful emotion is that when you're a baby and you're given that milky, creamy, sweet stuff, it, everything's right with the world. You feel connected, loved, significant. So no one says, I'm having a terrible time. I need some grilled trout, a little bit of wilted spinach. So I need ice cream, cookies, um, pasta, anything that has that same receptors of fatty, creamy, milky. And again, that's very clever that nature made babies really get hooked on that because then they didn't die. But, you know, years later, we're, we're in our 40s and we're thinking, well, I need ice cream, I need pudding, I need hot chocolate, I need cookies, because our brain has this belief that that sweet, creamy stuff 
fixes all your problems like that. Even though we know it doesn't, the logic says it doesn't, but the emotion says, no, it does. And emotion will always drive us and logic really won't. So if you want to fix anything, don't use logic, use emotion. Hmm. It's incredible we're going through this right now because this is one of the things that I'm dealing with right now in my journey is, you know, I am an emotional eater. Mm -hmm. So maybe we'll work through yeah, that in a second. Yeah, there's lots of them. Yeah, we'll, yeah. And of course, society makes you that. If you look at all the adverts for McDonald's, they call it Happy Meals and Fun Size, and we call chocolate heroes and celebration. And so you are kind of, it's, not, it's bad. In, it, you have nature on the one side that really wants you to eat a lot. Because if you think about it, if you were living out in a desert or the prairie and you found honey, that would never poison you, never kill you. You'd eat tons of it. You lay down fat. It was a good thing. It's only now because we have all of that stuff all around us that's become not a good thing. But sugar was actually great in lean times because it was totally safe. So you, on the one hand, you have nature that wants you to remember where sugar is and go back for more. No one says, oh, those peas keep calling my name. But they go, that, that chocolate, that ice cream, it's calling. I've got to go back for more. Because in fact, if you found some honey, you'd wake up and think, oh, my God, that honey. And you'd go back and you'd go back until it was all gone. And you remember exactly where it was. You might find some ripe mangoes. And your brain goes, remember where that is and keep going back. Because they're only going to be right for a couple of days. Mm. And so you have that going on, but then you also have the food industry pushing you to eat utter junk, ultra-processed, rubbish mm. food. But, you know, you're asked to eat junk food more than 400 times a day between your computer, the radio, the TV, adverts. You're not asked to eat a pear 400 times a day. And so it isn't surprising you become emotional eater because the, the, the food industry is condition you they spend so much money making you eat garbage and telling you you've got to have it and you need it you only have to walk into a shop and look at all the aisles of cereal which is really nothing it's just cookies it's just boxes of ground up cookies it's not even a food mm. but there's the marketing really gets to you yeah absolutely and and you know i i heard one other thing um, which I definitely am not a believer in this. I'm a knower of it because I know the potential we have of healing. But you healed yourself of cancer I did, twice yeah, with yeah. just your mind. Well, I had surgery as well. So okay. it wasn't, it, I shouldn't diminish that. It wasn't just my mind. In fact, I wouldn't have had the surgery, but my husband was so terrified. And doctor said, it's going to spread. And if you don't get that out, it'll spread to your liver and then it's game over. So I felt almost coerced into having surgery that I might not have had if it was just down to me. Because you believe you could have actually just eliminated it on your mm, own. I believe that my body could have defeated it entirely on its own with a bit of um, time. But I had a daughter and a husband who were both sure. really scared and sure. I sort of gave in to them. How did you do okay. that? How did you do that? How did you tap into the healing power of the mind, and how does one go about doing that? Well, you know, if you cut yourself, if I cut my arm now with a, with a little knife, it would heal itself perfectly without any help from me. If I eat some food, my body will, I don't have to get involved in the digestion process. My lungs breathe, my heart beats, my blood circulates. I don't have to do anything, it just does it. But in the same way, the body is always healing. You know, the body comes across infection every day. Apparently, we all have cancer in our body, and the body comes across it and tends to fight it. So if you eat some bad food, your body will make you vomit it up because the body is supremely intelligent. It knows how to heal. You know, like if, you, if I cut my finger, it'll get very hot because it'll, get in, it, it'll heat up to kill off an infection. And so the the body has an immense healing power you just have to know how to tap into it so i have something i call it dick healing it means direct instruct command code compel condition your body to heal itself so i would command my body to heal itself but also the body responds to pictures the way you feel about everything is down to the pictures you make and the words you form so if you um we're told, you know, there's, this person's got an infection, they're really sick, look, they're sneezing, everyone's bound to get it. The strongest force in humans is that we act in a way that matches what we describe. And our mind's job is to make our thoughts real. If you feel sad, your eyes fill up with tears. If you feel embarrassed, you go bright red. Think of food, your stomach rumbles. So we know that when you think a thought, the body starts to make that thought real. Especially for guys, if you think about sex, you get a very physical reaction, even if you're on your own. So I just extended that reality. Let me think about healing, because I know if I think about it and see it, my body is going to make it real. 
Mm. Because it does that every single day, every day of the week. You know, if you th the placebos, the big, if you think about a drug, what you think that drug is will affect you more than what's in it. If you think you're taking sleeping pills and you're taking amphetamines, you go to sleep and vice versa. So I, was, I told my body to heal itself. Um, I happened to have womb cancer, which was very good, really, because I didn't need a womb. I'd had a child. I wasn't having any more. So when I had womb cancer, I remember someone saying to me, you know, when they take your womb out, if the cancer cells spill out, that's terrible because then you get it everywhere else. So I imagined my womb wrapped in cling film or saran wrap. And I, I talked to them and said, you know, you've given me, you've done a great job. You gave me this great kid. And I'm going to let you go now because I've got to stay here for this great kid for a long, long time. So I imagined when my womb was removed, which is a very easy thing, it all being like a little fortress, it was all contained. I didn't think, oh my God, the cells are going to spill out and it's going to travel. I imagined it contained. I was very lucky. I was only stage one, which is nothing really. And then when it was gone, it was like, oh, I don't have cancer. I had it and I don't have it. In a day, it was all gone. And I would always command my body to heal itself. And one of the best ways is to sing a little song. So there's a little song called I Feel Pretty. Do you know that song, I Feel Pretty and Witty mm -hmm. and Well? So I use that, but I'd say my body is healing and perfect and it's healing all the time. And I sing this little ditty in my head and I would always imagine all the cells being perfect. I'd imagine my natural killer cells like going around my body, killing off any unwanted cells, like any rogue cancer cells. And then I would say my body is a wellness-making machine. It knows only one thing, wellness, how to do wellness. And that was my little motto, my mantra, if you like, my affirmation, my body is a wellness-making machine. And I went into hospital, had my surgery. I went home straight away. I didn't want to stay there. And they said, you don't want to stay? I'm like, no, I don't want to stay because if I stay here, I'm doing illness. I'm going to go home and watch Ray Donovan, get in my own bed, and I'm going to do wellness. And I remember I had that surgery. I came home and I did indeed get into bed, watch the last episode of Ray Donovan. I thought, oh, I'm doing wellness now because I'm back at home. There's no medication. There's no nurses. There's no bleeping. Nothing wrong with staying in hospital if you want to. But for me, I was doing wellness. And doing wellness meant being at home. And, you know, my husband did looked after me, made me green juices. And I recovered almost immediately. Beautiful. I mean, I was I was on, on stage in Costa Rica three weeks later. I was on stage with R Richard Bandra exactly a week later, because even though everyone said you got to take it easy, I wanted to live my life. I don't want to take it easy, and um, I think if you want to take it easy, it's great. But I just wanted to carry on and be normal, and I did. Beautiful. Hey, all you wonderful listeners in Europe, and specifically those of you in London. The time we all have been waiting for it is here. Join me live Thursday, October 26th at the Shaw Theater, which is located near the St. Pancras and King Cross Station. Listen, it's going to be a wonderful evening of connecting with like-minded individuals who share your passion for personal growth. And it's going to be an opportunity for us to get honest about life and the things that are holding us back from the life we truly deserve to live. Finally, I'm going to lead you through a profound spiritual experience that will catapult your healing journey. I can't wait. Go right now and get your tickets today at dannymorell.com backslash an evening with Danny. Once again, that's dannymorell.com backslash an evening with Danny. And I will see you Thursday, October 26th. And what got you into studying and understanding how human beings can transform their life financially through the power of the mind. How, how did you, Yeah. How, well, did, how did that journey start for you? You know, our whole relationship with money can be set before we're even five years old. And I would watch people, I saw this a lot. I could be in a store and a mother would say to a kid, go and get a little piece of candy. And they come and they go, who do you think you are? You can't have that. That's too expensive. You've embarrassed me. I put it back. Who do you think you are? And they're, still, they're very confused because you said go and get something. They come back with a huge box of chocolates and mother's very upset. And we hear things like I want never gets and don't ask and we can't afford it. And the funniest one, I can't find the money. 
because nobody finds money. I don't know where the money's coming from. And if you're brought up with parents who repeat that a lot, you know, we, we can't find the money, we haven't got any money, the money slips through my fingers. Very confusing for a small child because then they get worried that, you know, we can't find the money. One of my dearest friends told me that she remembered her father being on the phone saying, I don't know how to find the money and I can't pay for this. And she remember thinking, oh my God, I better find the money. My dad said... Trying to find the money is going to be the death of me. It's killing me trying to find the money. She said, well, I thought I better find it, but I'm five. How do I find it? Mm. And you go into this spin of, I can't find money. Whereas, you know, when I went, my brother went to a private school and I didn't. And at my school, they say things like, you have five pairs and you give three. How many you got left? Well, I've got two left. I've given away my equity. My brother's school said you have 11 businesses and you sell for how many you got left? Well, obviously the answer is six, but he's got all the money from his equity. I ate my equity or shared it. So even the way you teach math, we have six bananas, we give away two. Don't talk about bananas. Say so you've got eight properties and you sell four. You've got seven businesses, five stores, because even at that age, you want to train your kids to be smart. And with my little girl, when she was little, and she wanted to earn money. See, we do this thing. We go, you need to earn money. Wash all the dishes. But that's that means well, but you're teaching your kid you've got to do really menial work. So I say to my you can do my filing and you can make some little cards. And obviously she was completely hopeless at doing my filing. But I was showing her and you can do this and you can be mummy's assistant and you can write it on my appointments in a book, which she clearly couldn't do. But I made her believe that sure. she was earning money by using her brain. Right. I didn't ask her to wash dishes or take out the trash. So you want to start with your children very early. You know, you have a gift. You can monetize this. Mummy's going to pay you to make some little Christmas cards or you can sing a song and entertain or you can work out the map of where we're going and you can write that out because then they think, oh, I get paid for a skill. I don't want my kid to feel like I can get paid for washing dishes. I'm always going to have to do that kind of thing. But the biggest thing really was seeing how our money beliefs as children get right in the way like one of my clients said her dad had a shop and he worked six and a half days a week and on the half day when he'd lie on the sofa going oh this is going to kill me this is going to be the death of me you know running your own business is killing me and she thought I, I don't want that thing called a job that's killing you and all her life she had tremendous problems working because she formed a belief as a little girl or you might see your father talking about all oh, these taxes are a nightmare and my boss makes me want to die rather than saying to your kid, oh, I love going to work. It's wonderful and I'm creating something amazing because we learn what we live. So you have to start at a very early age teaching kids, hey, you have a gift and you're going to monetize that gift mm -hmm. because you're smart. I love that. It's so, it's so interesting because in the work that I do, I help people to return to that place yeah. where they could find yeah. First themselves, then their purpose, then their gift, and then mm. to be able to monetize that gift. Yeah. And it's 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 so interesting that you say that because monetizing your gift. That's exactly we should teach that in that's, school. That's what I do. That's of a, course. Yeah. I just never worded it like yeah. that. Yeah. Monetize you know? your gift. So really all we ever have to do is find our gift. A lot of us don't know what our gift is. Find our gift, believe in our gift, develop confidence, and then monetize it. Mm -hmm. Of course it's it's very hard to monetize your gift if you lack comedy. Your parents say, oh, stop showing off. Of course, an actress, don't be ridiculous. No, there's no money in that. You want to be a dancer, don't be silly. Or, you know, and so we often have parents who kind of, without meaning to, diminish our ambitions. So mm -hmm. you've got to find your gift, totally believe in your ability or what your gift is, and then take your gift to market, monetize it. But you have to have that belief first. That's right. Very hard to monetize your gift. Like, say you're an artist, but you think, oh, no one's going to like this work. It's That's not right. very good. Parents go, oh, it's all right, you know, but it's not really work, is it? So you have to, you've got to really get past. There are people making millions of dollars shaping eyebrows. There are people who can rented that drink called Prime. I mean, that was all hype. But, you know, if you're clever, you can create something. Who would have thought we spend m m so much money on trainers and bottles of water and stuff that really need but also everything people will buy almost without exceptions is how it will make you feel. feel and if you create a product that lessens someone's pain point and makes them feel good like training shoes 
then they'll buy it. And the days of, well, you've got to go to college and have a degree, you have to come from wealth. They're long gone. There are people who've come from nothing yeah. in the middle of nowhere who've created something amazing. I mean, I look at Dyson, who didn't, he, he looked at a vacuum and thought, I, I can make that better, and became the seventh richest man in England. He didn't even create it, he just upgraded something that's already out there. Yeah. I so know. you don't even have to be really, really bright. You don't have to be university educated. You have to be smart. So if, if I'm listening to this right now, and I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, number one, this is all resonating with me because yes, my father used to speak to me this way about money. Mm -hmm. what, what would be the first step that I would need to take? Or what are the things that I would need to say? Or what would okay. I need to do in order to like rewire my thinking about money? So one of the things I hear a lot from my clients is if you have more, someone else has less. Like if you have a bigger piece of cake, your sister hasn't got enough cake. If I give you five dollars then i don't have enough money so we have this belief, oh if i have more you have less i shouldn't have noble people shouldn't have more and we use all these words like fat cat rich bitch filthy rich yeah. so we have this belief that money is bad so the first thing you do is go back and have a look at that but who told you that your grandmother what did she know was that even true it may have been true for her but it doesn't have to be true for you mm. so when i was growing up i heard a belief men don't like women with money if you have money, men never, don't like women no, with money. You'll never find a husband if you've got money. Of course, that was true a hundred years ago. Yeah, but it isn't true now. Yeah. It hasn't been true for a long time. So, is it true? Is it true for you? Can you change it? And then you you, you challenge the belief, and then you change the belief. If I have more, you won't have less. You'll have more. Me having more means I can do more. So. If I have more, my brother's going to have less. Well, if I have more, I can give my brother money. I can pay for his kids to go to private school. Then you, you, you challenge the belief and then you change it. Or I can show you to have more too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the idea that, oh, you know, there's a pool of money and if I take some out, there's less. That's not true. Mm -mm. There's a lot of money. It's not very fair. If you have a lot of money, you can employ people, help people. So you've got to think, well, that's a crazy belief. I don't know. You can choose. You see, the thing is, you make your beliefs. And then your beliefs make you, and then confirmation bias means you look for proof of what you've chosen to believe. Oh, I shouldn't have more because it's greedy. Rich people have sold their soul to the devil. And here's one I hear a lot. Spiritual people shouldn't have money. Yeah, I get that or, one. I get that one, yeah. I should only make money doing something spiritual. And yeah, I know many of my clients who are billionaires who are not spiritual, but they've got so much money, they become spiritual. They go, oh, well, I've got all this money. I'm going to rewild swathes of Norfolk. Um, I've got all this money. I'm going to open a children's home. And I've got all this money. I'm going to create a better school. And we look at people like there are many philanthropists who do that. They create schools. They create hospitals. They put water in countries that need it. They rewild. They do great things. And, and so if you having money means you can do something good with it, that will get rid of the block. I'm a bad person for wanting money. Money is a dirty word, dirty cash. You go, no, money can be beautiful. If I could do something noble and amazing by having money, then I should 100% do it. I love that. And so many people, you know, it, it's interesting because the, the mind tends to defend the belief. Yeah, the confirmation bias. You look for proof. Absolutely. And so... And you find it too. Yeah, you will. You always will. And then you'll always challenge. Yeah. You'll, 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 you'll chat. Many people yeah. might be challenging what you're saying right now. Oh, yeah, right sure. Now. Of course. Because I, I have people on Instagram that, you know, you know, it's very rare, but I see it when it happens and they're like, why don't you do what you do for free? Yeah. So the therapist shouldn't make any money. Yeah. You know, you're a therapist helping people. But actually, since I made money, because I was a therapist who had a comfort level, wasn't making a lot of money. But since I became a more successful therapist, we've created programs at schools. We have a five-day challenge, an anti-bullying program. And that's all completely free. And if I wasn't successful, I wouldn't want to use my money to create programs that are in thousands of schools. People are like, oh, my God, this is changing everything. These kids are doing better. You're... My father said to me years ago, the job of the school is to grow a kid's self-esteem. That's the most important job of a school and indeed a parent too. If your kids grow up without self-esteem, you, you've failed. 
But schools don't teach that. So I created self-esteem programs. Of course, I had my dad's voice in my ear, who was such a great guy. But I could never have done that if I didn't have some money behind me sure. because it's it's something, it's... It takes resources. Not prof- if a non-profit, I don't charge any of the schools for this. We, we give it all away. It's our joy to give it away. But you can't give away what you don't have. And so the belief that, oh, I shouldn't have money. A lot of people with money do amazing and beautiful things with it. And, and that's a good thing. Yeah. So um, I remember on your Instagram, you were doing um, affirmations. Yeah. Like, what are some of your favorite affirmations around money? You know, I it's I talk about abundance a lot. So when, when I had my little girl, I thought I could never have a baby, but I had a baby, but I was a single parent and we didn't really have money. And I, she said, Mommy, are we rich? You go, darling, we're so rich. We're so wealthy. We're so abundant. But I never talked about money because wealth is a state of mind. I mean, you can mm-hmm. come into it and think, oh my gosh, I've got heating. I've got a fire. I've got a bed. And I took my daughter once to feed some homeless people at Christmas. When I came home. I felt like a millionaire. I thought, well, look at this. I've got a house. I've got clean sheets. I got heating. They were living on the street, and I felt immensely wealthy because wealth is relative. You can go to certain places and think, gosh, I feel like a king here because I've got a nice home. It's not a little shack made of um, plywood or corrugated iron. So if you don't have money, think, how can I say I'm wealthy? How can I say I have money? Say I am wealthy. Mm. I'm abundant. I am rich. I'm a millionaire. You know, there's, a, there's a song, and I still love this song about someone who just had a baby who said, shake hands with a millionaire because he had his son in his arms, and that's what he felt like. So say things like, I'm so wealthy, I am so I have an abundant life, I'm living in abundance, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm wealthy. You can add money too, but you see, that's not a lie. People say, I don't lie to myself. I think you should. I think you should lie, cheat, and steal every day. I think you should lie to your mind, cheat, fear, cheat that awkward and steal back the supreme confidence you were born with. So I'm a big fan of lying, cheating, and stealing. And I think when people say, oh, no, I'm dead broke, I'm stony broke, I'm broke. But that's not true. You're not broke. You live in a country where you don't ever have to be broke. So we lie to ourselves anyway. I'm broke. I'm skint. We have all these words. I'm penniless. I'm poor. But it's probably not even true. So if you're willing to lie to yourself, money slips through my fingers, I run out of money before I run out of week, I can't find money, well, they're they're already lying. So tell yourself a better lie. I attract wealth. I do amazing things with it. I've got such a generous heart. I'm smart. I got a gift. The universe gave me a gift, and the universe that gave me that gift will support me in monetizing Mm -hmm. it. And my gift helps other people. Right. I'm a great role model. When people see what I'm doing, I inspire them to do it themselves too. So tell yourself really good things that elevate you, expand all the time. Don't say things that contract you. Oh, you know, when you have money, you never know who your friends are. It's lonely at the top. No, it isn't. It's just very crowded at the bottom. So challenge these beliefs. It's not lonely at the top. And you do know who your friends are when you have money. That's up to you to be discerning enough. We, I mean, we're smart. We can work out if someone's using us for money or not. Don't yeah. deny yourself money just in case someone tries to rip you off. Why would you deny yourself wealth and the gift you can do with it in case somebody wants to use you for money? If you're mm-hmm. smart enough to make money, you're smart enough to know who's good and who's bad, who should be in your life and who shouldn't be. So we, we have these silly statements, but they're very disabling. And so... One of the best things is think of statements that empower you. I've got a gift. I monetize that gift. I do great things with that gift. I'm a great, I'm an inspiration. People look at me and think, wow, because Tony Robbins is an inspiration. He came from nothing at 17. He's an inspiration. Adele is an inspiration. She was brought up on a council estate with no father. She wasn't skinny. She's an inspiration. Eminem is an inspiration. A white kid with blue eyes and blonde hair has become a famous rapper, rapper, and they all kicked through. When they said that door shut, they kicked it open. So you want to be an inspiration. We think, oh, yeah, you helped me. I learned from you. You don't, you're not an inspiration by sitting at home thinking, oh, I better not do that. People might not like me. And actually, who cares? As long as you like you, mm-hmm. that's the most important thing. So you've got to challenge all those silly rules, break them, make new ones. And again, if you could, if people, if you could write a list of who would benefit from you having wealth and money, 
and it's a good list, then you, you're kicking out the barriers and, oh, yes, my kids would benefit. My parents would benefit. I could create a business and employ people. Mm. So that's a wonderful thing. There's a guy in England called Mr. Timpson who created um, a business cutting keys. And he made so much, and he must have, he and his wife fostered about 55 children. They took children in as foster parents because they had them, they lived in a big country estate and they'd let them ride their bikes through the living room. And But he said the wealth he made, the joy that he got was that he could foster so many children wow. and give them a home. But he couldn't have done that if he hadn't had a business right. of key cutting. And he was such a philanthropist that he would, I, I think they had a dry clean, he would, if you were, didn't have any money, he would dry clean your clothes for nothing. And there are, remember the guy that had the shoe company? What was that shoe company? Tom's. Oh, where Tom's. if you bought a pair of shoes, one, they one gave pair, a pair yeah. to someone else. Yeah. And where I, where I arrived in London, they have a cafe and it said, you know, if every coffee you buy, we give a coffee to someone. They'd have a sign in the middle, if you need coffee, come in. You know, if you need food, come in. We'll never turn you away. And they would get other people. So like, when you buy the coffee, you can put that money to change in here. And it gives coffee to people who can't afford it. So... That's a good thing. A lot of people do great things with wealth, and they're not fat cats. I love that. And they're not filthy rich. And so, and so, what, what about someone that has created, you know, wealth? And now, what what do you think the gap is between people that have money and a Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk? Like, what 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 do, what do you think? That's another level, right? Yeah, what do you think you the know, gap is? Um, Elon Musk is a genius. The guy that founded Amazon, what's his name again? Jeff Bezos. No, no, not the other one. Um, what's the guy know. that's got a Chinese wife? Um, oh, Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. See, those people weren't classic, went to university, got a degree, came from money. They, they've all come out of the mold, and I like that. But they had an idea. Mm. Like Steve Jobs, they had an idea. And they had courage and confidence behind that idea. And we know that Steve Jobs tried many times and failed but he kept going. So they have what I call the bounce back, fact, like a big rubber ball. That failed, I'm bouncing back. That didn't work, I'm bouncing back. And the difference between people who fail and people who succeed is very clear. People who succeed will do the things they hate to get where they want to be. They'll do the things they dislike. They might wait tables, mop floors. On their way to success, they'll do things they do not want to. People who fail will give up their dream quicker than, oh, I wouldn't do that, that's degrading. Or, right. you know, I've tried five times, it's not going to work. So there isn't a big difference. Because successful people leave clues. And there's a couple of things they do that the people who fail don't do. And one of them is they do what they absolutely do not want to do. They'll put aside their likes. To get to where they want to go, they'll do what they don't want to do. The second thing is they do things they want to do first. They've got to make a difficult call. They do it first. It's very interesting. And people think, oh, I'll do that later. I don't want to do that. They take action every single day in the direction of their goal on their way to success. When they've made it, they, you don't have to work every day, but they'll do something every day, mm -hmm. even on their day off. They'll make some calls, look at some YouTube videos, rehearse more. They delay gratification. They don't come in and go, oh, I'm going to watch a movie, have my dinner. They go, no, I'm going to do a bit more work, and then I'll have the movie and dinner. And they're very good at praising themselves. They, they big up and say, I'm doing great here. This is amazing. They don't use criticism. They use praise to motivate themselves. And in, the, in the world we're in now, where you're probably going to work for yourself, don't have to go, hey, what a great job you're doing. You better learn to praise yourself because you have a praise muscle that will wither away if you don't, use it so all of those five habits if you like gifted people tend to be born with those but it doesn't matter whether you you're born it. with them or not you can adopt them and develop them so if you mm. want to be successful be prepared to do what you don't want to do do it first take action every day in the direction of delay gratification big up is oh there's another one they bounce back from rejection they don't yeah. hear a denial they hear a delay not today, not right now. When someone says no, they go, okay, I'll come back tomorrow. You know, I love that story of Celine Dion sending her cassette to Sony and calling them. They said, we didn't like it. She went, oh, no, you didn't even play it. You couldn't play that, so you didn't like it. But the confidence in her voice made them go and find it and play it and go, oh, right, okay. That's right. So you've got to have that. You don't like it. You're not ready. 
You don't like me? Let me show you why you should. You don't like my product? Well, let me alter it. And if you look at Shark's Tank and Dragon's Den, some people who reject, laughed off that show came mm -hmm. back with amazing products like Trunky and Tink Tangle Teaser. And even though Dragon's Den, this is terrible. They didn't take no for an answer, which is another thing. Don't hear denial here. That's just the delay. Mm -hmm. You know, I know when I was a writer, my first book was when you sent out manuscript. I remember that feeling of that thud. Because in England, we have post boxes, not mailboxes. And, and I'm thinking, oh, that's my manuscript. They only send it back when they don't want it. So I remember being in my living room hearing a thud. And I knew that was my manuscript being returned. And I thought, oh. No, but I got up and I sent it back out to someone else and I kept sending it out. And eventually, I think my agent said, you're lucky if you get 2,000 pounds. I got 130,000 pounds for it because I kept sending it back. I thought someone's going to love this. Eight people don't, but the ninth person will. Yeah. And it, that's another thing that people do. They, they keep going. You know, they, they get rejections. They, you know, Luther Vandross, people said, you're an overnight success. He went, yeah, I sang jing jingles for 12 years. That's a long night. Yeah. People said, but Luther, hey, this is good. You're singing jingles. They said, no, but I want to be a singer. I don't want to be a backing singer. I don't want to sing. I want to be a singer in the charts. And it took him a long time, but he kept going. And so many of us think, oh, what's the point? The universe is saying no. I got to knock back or kick back, but you, you got to keep going. It's so important to keep going. Hey guys, before you continue listening, I wanted to introduce you to the sponsor of this episode, Athletic Greens. I decided to give AG1 a try because I wanted a supplement that actually tastes great, boosts my energy and supports my immune system. Uh, especially for someone like myself that fasts all day, I take it in the morning before starting my day and it makes me feel incredible. It makes me feel like I'm doing something good for my body. It also helps me save an enormous amount of time and it makes my life so much easier with just one scoop in the morning. So it makes it a very seamless and easy daily habit for me. Just one serving of this stuff, AG1, supports my long-term gut health it has 75 high quality vitamins in it, minerals, and whole food source ingredients. So if you're looking for a simple and cost-effective supplement routine, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of their vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. So just go to athleticgreens.com backslash Danny. That's athleticgreens.com backslash Danny and go check it out today. I want to touch on be, before we end here, because I think this is uh, part of your magic and your gift is um, hypnosis. Mm -hmm. How did you discover it and, 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 and how do you use it to help people? So when I was working for Jane Fonda, looking at all these anorexic, bulimic, orthorexic girls, I was looking for something that would change that mental state. You know, most people... 70 percent of people turning up at the hospital don't have diseases of organic. They have diseased thinking. It's diseased thinking that yeah. makes us ill. Some people say it's 90% of our illnesses are from diseased thinking, not diseased organs. And I wanted to find a way that would overcome diseased thinking like that. Because no one's got time to write a hundred affirmations, a thousand goals. We haven't even got to sit and meditate for 90 minutes. Life is fast. And I was always interested in one thing. People in pain, if you went to the doctor in pain or the chiropractor or the dentist, they go, oh, let me take you out of pain. You've got an infection in your tooth, I'm going to fill it. You've got a hurt back, I'm going to set it. You, you've got, you've got an, let me give you some antibiotics. They wouldn't go, well, we're going to discuss this for a couple of years. And I thought therapy should be the same as any emergency treatment, doctor, dentist, chiropractor. So I decided to create a therapy that was fast. How fast? Oh, five minutes can be an hour, but you can, people say, can you change in 20, you can change in 21 minutes, you can change in 21 seconds, if you know how. I mean, you know, if you ate some lobster when they were violently sick, you'll never eat it again. Right. Because in the minute you were bring it over the, over the toilet, you'll never you'll eat that again, right. and your brain right. remembers. Yeah. So it goes back to what I was saying in the beginning, how you dialogue with yourself. You know, we're all taught, hey, if you want a great business, learn to talk to your clients, want a great marriage, learn to talk to your partner, but actually the biggest thing to learn is how to dialogue with you. And there's some key phrases you can use that will absolutely change. One of them is this, I have chosen this and I've chosen to love it. So imagine you're opening your own business, designing your website, and you go, oh, I've got to do that website and I could go to the bar, I could be going out. You go, no, 
I've chosen to spend all weekend doing my website. I've chosen to love it. It's like saying I've chosen to go to the gym. I've chosen to love it. When I go to the gym, I go, I love lunges. I, love, I mean, I really don't. I love crunches. My body loves it. Because I understand if I say to myself, my body loves these sit-ups, my body loves these, the plank, I, I bypass it and go, oh, this is boring, this is painful. I go, no, I love it, love it, right, love right, it. Right. And of course, if you're running a marathon, right at the end, you'll have the crowd cheering and you get excited because you're thinking, oh, no, this is good, I like it. So one of the magic senses you use is to say, I've chosen this, I've chosen to love it. I've chosen to stop eating cake and to have berries, I've chosen to love it. I've chosen to say yes to salad, no to pizza, I've chosen to love it because your mind goes, oh, you want this and you love it. So you wouldn't go, I'm going to have a tattoo on my arm. It's going to hurt. You go, no, I'm excited. Well, I've chosen it. So I'm choosing it because the mind gets very confused when you go, oh, I don't want to do this. Or what if I get rejected? What if I ask that person out and they don't like me? No, I've chosen and, to ask but them But I've chosen. And whatever they say, I've chosen to love the fact I'm brave, I'm bold, I'm, advent I'm courageous, I'm, I'm ready, I can do anything. So little phrases change. And the thing with hypnosis is that that's when you learn to put these phrases because something magical happens in hypnosis. It doesn't happen out of it. There are three things that happen. One is you have a critical factor in your mind. If I said, I want you to stand on a soapbox and give a talk now, an anti, I don't know, anti something talk. Uh -huh. You might go, oh, I couldn't do that. But if you want to do in hypnosis, you go, no, I can do it. I'm going to give that talk. It's going to be amazing. The second thing that happens is that the mind which sends messages to the body, starts to send much better ones. You're not um, de tired, you're dehydrated, you're not nervous, you're excited. But it also starts to interpret the messages coming back very differently. And thirdly, which is the most beautiful thing, is your body is run by a network of intelligence which is influenced by the mind. In hypnosis, you go into that network. You literally go into this network of intelligence and you say things like, again, my body is a healing machine. I have a fantastic, my immune system is powerful beyond belief. And the mind doesn't go, no, that's not true. Don't be silly. It goes, yeah, yeah, if you say it, it must be true. So you can, we know that you can boost your immune system. Many things boost it, orgasms, exercise, but also thought. And so that's the beautiful thing. You go into that network and you start to give yourself better messages. And the mind goes, yeah, leave that with me. Because this is the genie. Right. And your wish is its command. So make better wishes because they'll probably come true. So I've never done hypnosis. Mm -hmm. or I, we have, looks like a little bit of time left. Okay. Are, are you up for it? Sure. For a little five minute. Yeah, quick? absolutely. Okay. What do I have to do? I want you to look up as high as you can. Look up? Yeah. I want you to keep your chin where it is. Okay. See, when look at me. When you go to sleep at night, your eyes roll up like that. So if you roll up your eyes, you're going into that brain wave where you're going straight into the subconscious. So keep your chin here, but okay. look at me. That's it. Roll, that's it. Roll up your eyes. Keep them up. Breathe in and out three times. Keep them up. And every time you blink, hypnosis is coming. I mean, the more you blink, the deeper hypnosis is coming upon you right now. And now this time, keep your eyeballs up. Close your eyelids right down, all the way down. Drop your chin just a fraction. Get that same looking down feeling that you might get as you're looking over a balcony or down a flight of stairs, you're looking down 10 steps. You're moving on to step 10 and nine, going deeper into an awareness of yourself. You're taking step eight and seven, going deeper, deeper, deeper with every sound you hear. You're taking step six, the sound of your heartbeats, taking you deeper, further into powerful healing hypnosis. You're taking step five and four. Every sound, every noise around you is taking you deeper into powerful healing hypnosis. You're taking step three and two. You're taking step one. Go deeper, deeper, deeper. And I want you to just stretch your arms out in front of you. As if you're holding onto the handlebars of a bike, close your wrists if you're holding onto something. And I want you to imagine in your left hand you're holding a big red fire bucket filled with about 90 pounds of heavy wet sand and straight away you can feel the weight of that bucket pulling your left arm down the weight of that bucket is traveling from your fingers to your wrist to your elbow right up into your shoulder and as your left arm pulls up down drops down and moves down you are moving dropping deeper deeper into hypnosis meanwhile 
In your right arm, you're holding an enormous helium-filled balloon. It's absolutely weightless, lighter than air, bigger than you, and it's taking your right arm up with it. Your right arm is floating up, moving up, pulling up, traveling up. Your right arm is so weightless if it's going to float away from your very socket of your arm as it goes up and up and up and up. And as your arm goes up, you're realizing something very impressive about you. You have a great ability to accept suggestions. You're going to notice something. One arm is weightless, one arm is way down because of your ability to make something real. I want you to notice now, the harder you try to push that right arm down, the more it's like trying to push a beach ball underwater. It just won't have it. Try to push your right arm down. It just floats up higher than ever. And now try to lift your left arm up and find that someone's encased it in concrete and it just won't have it. The more you try to lift it up, the more heavy, impossibly heavy it is. But now as I count to three... You're going to let go of the bucket and the balloon, go 150 times deeper. One, two, three, let go of the bucket, go deeper, deeper, deeper. You're now in this beautiful network of intelligence where your mind is influencing your body. You can influence your I'm going to give you some lovely suggestions you're going to really like. They're going to sink in like hot butter on toast. Just as the toast can't reject the butter, at this level your mind won't reject it, it'll let them in. You are ready to be the most amazing dad. You're about to have a beautiful baby girl. And you're going to be the most phenomenal parent. You are so tuned into that little soul that you've made. You're a natural father. You know how to soothe. You raise your daughter in the most beautiful way. You understand that your job as a father is to raise a child with high self-esteem. And you do a phenomenal job, an awesome job. You and your wife together raise this incredible little girl. She's a gift to the planet because you raise her with high self-esteem. You're an amazing dad. You're an amazing person. Your podcasts help people. They make a difference. And every day you feel so inspired. Every day you are massively motivated, powerfully inspired to send people messages that help them. You have a tremendous gift. Your career fills you up with meaning and purpose because every day you fill others with meaning and purpose. Your interviews, your guests, your messages give people meaning, purpose. You help people grow. You help people to make a difference. You contribute to people's well-being or the things you say on air. And you have this amazing career that gives you connection, significance, diversity, also certainty. You're doing a good thing. Your career gives you meaning, purpose. You grow you contribute, you make a difference. And every day you come up with more and more ideas of how can I reach an audience? How can I help them? How can I make people feel better? And every night when you go to bed, you think this wonderful thought, someone in the world is having a better life just because of something I introduced to them on my podcast, on my blog. You're growing, contributing, making a difference every day. And you are confident, you're self-assured. Every day you massively raise your own sense of self-worth, self-value, self-confidence, self as you do the same thing for your beautiful little daughter, for your beautiful first child and many others you have too. You have a gift to raise your sense of self-worth, self-value, self-image, and all the people around you, show them how to raise self-worth, self-image, self-belief. You're a great parent. You've got a great career. You do what you love. You love what you do. And you just get better at it every day because you're filled with passion, and drive and motivation. So knowing it, feeling it, believing it, living it, this isn't even what you do. This is who you are. Knowing it, radiating from the very pores of your body, it's who you are now. Just slowly, calmly, easily, just open up your eyes, come back and feeling amazing, feeling gifted, feeling powerful, feeling incredible. Just open up your eyes. Hmm. How do you feel? Thank you. What was Grateful. that like when your arm just wouldn't when it went up of its own accord? Yeah, it was wild. And your other arm, what was that like when it became so incredibly yeah, heavy? Yeah, it was just like stuck. And what was it like when you couldn't lower one and raise the other? When I said try to lower your right arm and it won't have it. It was just wild. It was just. And try to lift up your left arm and you just can't because you're very fit and strong. Yeah. And what was it like when you heard those suggestions? You know what's interesting? They were 
just confirming. Yeah, of course, confirming. Yeah, confirming who I am. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was just—it was just nice to hear it. Yeah. Outside of me. Yeah, because the most important word you'll ever hear in your whole life are the words that you say to yourself. Yeah. See, if I say to you, "Oh, you're great, you're great, you're great," I might be manipulative. I might say, "Can I? I want to come back on your show because I'm I'm manipulating with praise." If I say to you, you're a horrible person, I might be having a bad day. So the mind understands that there's an agenda going on. But when you say, I'm great or I'm rubbish, your mind goes, yeah, well, it must be true. There is no agenda. Right. So we've all got to be responsible for not saying negative stuff, but for saying positive, because there's nothing that will build you up better than praise. And your own praise is better than someone else's because there's no agenda. I love if that. we could all make our kids every day say, I matter, I'm enough, I'm significant. I got a special gift. That's why I'm here to find it and monetize it. If every person did that with their kid every day, mm. if every school did that, made each child say, "I matter, I'm significant, I'm enough, I'm lovable, and I've got a gift," bullying would just cease to exist in schools. It would. I love that. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. I've loved it. Yeah. How do How do more people find out about you? Oh. If you go to marissapeer.com, we have so many free audios. We have free audios on love blocks, money blocks, health blocks, success, all free. We don't ask for a card. Take as many as you want and give them to other people too. So marissapeer.com, if you want to learn to do what I do, we've, I've trained 16,000 people and to be an RTT. Those do what I just did with you like that. Beautiful. Go to rtt.com to find out how you can train with us. No background in therapy is required. I love that. The best job in the world. So marissapeer.com or rtt.com. And what's your Instagram? Oh, my Instagram is Marissapeer Therapy. Beautiful. So you can that. find me everywhere on YouTube, on Instagram. We give away a lot of free stuff, a lot of videos and audios and programs and challenges. And take as many as you want because they too will grow your That's sense right. of self-worth. And when you have that, when you elevate who you are, the wonderful thing is around the world, everyone else joins you in your elevated sense of what you're worth. That's right. I yeah. love that. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I hope you I, I, I hope you tuned into that that hypnosis. Mm. I hope you participated in it. And if not, rewind it and 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 pretend like that yeah. was for you. Or well, take the you. free audios because they put you in a hypnotic ah, state beautiful. and even they better. remove your money blocks, your love blocks, your success, even your health. They, they wipe it all out and even better. fill in something better that you, you matter. You're amazing. I love that. And you absolutely do. You of course absolutely you do. do. So that's this week's episode of The Higher Self. I hope you enjoyed it and I can't wait to see you next week. Thanks for watching this week's episode of The Higher Self. If you heard something in this week's episode that caused you to think maybe, just maybe, there was a higher potential for your life, maybe there was a potential to earn and receive financial freedom, to attract the relationship of your dreams, or to improve your health, that's what we specialize in. We help wonderful human beings like yourself to unravel all of the limiting thoughts, feelings, and emotions that you've been living through so that you can finally tap into your life's truest potential. If you'd like to talk more about that, we invite you to join us on Instagram or Facebook and email us the word discover more. And when my team sees that, they will reach out to you, send you the details of how we could help you on your pathway to a life of abundance, fulfillment, and creating the absolute life of your dreams. Message us right now the words discover more now on Instagram or Facebook, and we'll see you soon.